Hi, I'm Andy the Palm Springs Linguist and I'm at Disneyland in California. Today I'm going to explore the history of the sexes in Disneyland and I came on the perfect day because take a look at the planner behind me. It's not Mickey Mouse, it's Minnie Mouse for the very first time in Disneyland history. Disneyland opened on July 17, 1955. American culture has changed tremendously since the 50s, and attitudes about differences in gender, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity have evolved, not just in the culture at large, but also in the operation of Disney theme parks. This is the story of these changes as they were made in Disneyland. I was a Disneyland cast member in the 1980s and 1990s, and was fortunate enough to witness many of these changes firsthand. Disneyland has always framed itself as a show. The customers are called guests. The area where guests can visit is called on stage. The area where guests cannot see is called backstage. The employees are called cast members and their uniforms are called costumes. When Disneyland hires new cast members, rather than hiring you for a job, it is framed as casting you for a role. Every cast member has a role, whether they are singing on stage or sweeping up trash. With the goal of creating a show, Disneyland used to cast new hires into roles based on what made sense thematically. Some sometimes at the expense of inclusion. In the location where Storybook Land Canal Boats now resides, an attraction called Canal Boats of the World opened with the park on July 17, 1955. Canal Boats of the World was operated by an all-male crew, likely because when people envision canal boats, such as the gondolas in Venice, Italy, they have traditionally been steered by men. Canal Boats of the World was inspired by Madurodam, a park in the Netherlands that showcases a whole town of miniatures. The Fantasyland boat ride was supposed to have miniatures of landmarks from around the world, but since it never got completely finished, there was not much of anything on display. Canal Boats of the World never met its potential and closed down not too long after opening. It reopened in 1956 as Storybook Land Canal Boats, rethemed with fairy tale miniatures, and not too long thereafter, the crew was switched from all males to all females. An all female crew remained the status quo until 1990 when men finally returned to work the canal boats, but this time alongside the women. The boats of Storybook could also be viewed high above Fantasyland from the hanging buckets of the Skyway. The Skyway had stations in Fantasyland and Tomorrowland. The buckets rode right through a hole in the center of the Matterhorn. Rumor had it that Walt Disney was questioned as to why the Matterhorn had holes in it. Supposedly his response was, well, it is a Swiss mountain after all. Only men worked on the Skyway, myself included, probably because it was a very physical ride to work. You used your own body strength to fully stop and stabilize the buckets, to unload passengers, and then again to propel the bucket around the corner for it to be loaded with new passengers. Skyway was closed down permanently in 1994, so women never did get a chance to work there. However, in 2019, Walt Disney World opened the Skyliner as transportation between Epcot, Disney's Hollywood Studios, and multiple Disney World resorts. Although the Skyliner is reminiscent of the old Skyway, since the technology of the Skyliner is more sophisticated and less physical than the old Skyway, both men and women work on the modern Skyliner. Skyway is on my list of Disneyland locations I miss. Another location on that list, up at the very top, is the Tahitian Terrace in Adventureland. Up until 1993, there was a Polynesian-style dinner show similar to a luau that performed during peak seasons and busier weekends at a restaurant called the Tahitian Terrace. The Tahitian Terrace, located around the corner from the Enchanted Tiki Room, where Tropical Hideaway is found today, had a South Pacific theme. The Adventureland restaurant shared a kitchen with the Plaza Pavilion, whose guest-facing entrance was on Main Street, where Jolly Holiday Bakery Cafe now resides. Racial casting was used for the servers who waited on your table and the hosts who seated you at your table. The intent was probably to cast Pacific Islanders, such as Tahitians and Hawaiians, into the roles, but since there were not many many Pacific Islanders living in Orange County at the time, men and women of East Asian descent were also cast into these roles. The Tahitian Terrace closed in 1993 and was replaced with Aladdin's Oasis later that same year. Sadly, that show didn't last either, and the location was eventually modified in 2018 to become Tropical Hideaway, opening its doors as a casual food location. Kose, the host bird from the Enchanted Tiki Room, has been asking us for years, whatever happened to Rosita? Well, she has now found her Adventureland home at the Tropical Hideaway. The early years of the Enchanted Tiki Room had an all-female crew, except get this, 
Sometimes the lead in charge of the attraction was a man, even though the rest of the crew were all women. Occasionally, in years gone by, you may have seen a man on duty at the Tiki Room, but he was either the lead in charge or he was a guy temporarily sent over from the Jungle Cruise to give the women one of their breaks. The Enchanted Tiki Room changed from an all-female crew to a co-ed crew many years before most other attractions made the change. Past the Tiki Room, deeper into Adventureland, you will find the Jungle Cruise, an opening day attraction that is still going strong. For the majority of these years, the Jungle Cruise boats have been navigated only by male skippers, presumably because a typical guest in the 1950s would likely picture a man being the driver of a riverboat exploring the jungle. This briefly changed during the summer of 1974, when a small number of women were trained and worked on the Jungle Cruise. But this ended after a brief stint. It was tried again once in the 1980s, but that didn't stick either. A friend of mine, Sue Barnaby, was an attractions host on the west side who worked side by side for years with the guys who worked Jungle Cruise. But only when they were working on Big Thunder, Tiki Room, or another co-ed attraction. Sue went on a trip as a guest to Walt Disney World in Florida, where she went on their Jungle Cruise. What did she find in the Florida jungle that wasn't in the jungles of Anaheim? female skippers. So as soon as she returned to work in California, Sue reported this finding to her supervisors and requested to be trained on the Jungle Cruise. The supervisors accepted her request and in 1995, Sue Barnaby and Joy Weber Brunty were trained to be Jungle Cruise skippers, which started a domino effect all across the park of formerly single sex attractions becoming co-ed. Sue Barnaby remembers that in the beginning, sometimes her boatload of guests would be surprised when they found out that a woman was their skipper. So she would assure them, well, at least if we get lost out there in the jungle, I'll stop and ask for directions. Training cast members of both sexes on all attractions happened from that point forward. Some attractions, such as the Jungle Cruise, never before had costumes designed for women. So most previously single sex attractions had to have new costumes designed and made for the opposite sex to accommodate the new co-ed crews. From the rivers of the jungle to the rivers of America. Indian War Canoes opened at Disneyland as part of Frontierland's Indian Village expansion in 19. 1956. Each canoe had a Native American guide. Since it was difficult to cast enough Native Americans to operate the Indian War canoes, sometimes Latinos were cast into the role. The attraction changed names to Davy Crockett Explorer Canoes in 1971, prior to the opening of the new land, Bear Country. I was trained as a cast member to work the canoes in 1990. I always loved canoeing the back part of the Rivers of America, where I felt like I was a million miles away from Anaheim, California. I even got to do some canoe testing when we purposely tried to rock the canoe to the point that we fell into the river. Working the canoes is a very physical job. The canoes don't have a motor, so they are propelled by guests rowing. Of course, often the guests don't take the job very seriously, and it's up to the two cast members to pick up the slack. Due to the physical nature of the job and the costumes resembling Davy Crockett himself, Canoes had an all-male crew until 1995 when Joy Weber Brunty became the first woman to work on the Canoes. When steering the canoe, one thing to keep in mind is to steer clear of the bigger boats, the Mark Twain and the Columbia. While the Mark Twain Riverboat has traveled the rivers of America since Disneyland's opening in 1955, per Walt Disney's wish to add more river traffic, the sailing ship Columbia was added in 1958. It is a replica of the Columbia Rediviva, the first American ship to circumnavigate the globe in 1790. Not surprisingly, both Mark Twain and Columbia were only operated by men until 1995. Joy Weber Brunty was the first woman to be trained on the Mark Twain Riverboat as well as the sailing ship Columbia. The Mike Fink Keel Boats was another boat ride that traveled around the rivers of America. The keel boats were small boats. Each one had a guide that both drove the boat and spieled to the guests pointing out the animals and sights along the river. Keel boats had an all-male crew. In 1995, all attractions that hadn't already become co-ed became co-ed. However, the keel boats attraction was on hiatus from September 1994 to March 1996. It did eventually reopen, but it closed down permanently in 1997. So no women ever actually worked on the attraction. There were a couple of women who were trained on keel boats, but they were trained on them for the unique reason 
that these specific women were leads on the neighboring river attraction, rafts to Tom Sawyer's Island. And all leads on the rafts had to know how to drive the keel boats in case they were ever needed to assist in towing any of the other boats on the river with a keel boat. While most attractions on the river had all male crews until 1995, rafts to Tom Sawyer's Island was an exception, with a long tradition of having both men and women on the rafts crew, transporting guests across the river to Tom Sawyer's Island and back for many years. Now, on to the other side of Tom Sawyer's Island, where there used to be mine train through nature's wonderland, a slow-moving train ride in Frontierland which showed nature scenes of the woods and the deserts of the southwest. The attraction was operated by all men. It closed down on January 2nd, 1977 to make room for Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, a roller coaster with a similar theme that opened in 1979. Unlike its predecessor, Big Thunder has always had a crew of both men and women. Walt Disney was a train lover, so Disneyland has always had multiple train rides to pick from. The now dissolved company Retlaw Enterprises, owned by the heirs of the Disney family, owned two of Disneyland's train attractions until 1982, the Disneyland Railroad and the Monorail. The Disneyland Railroad was operated by an all-male crew under Retlaw Enterprises. I worked in Tomorrowland attractions in the 1980s, and I remember former Retlaw cast members getting trained on new attractions to integrate them into the regular attractions department. Retlaw is Walter spelled backwards, in honor of of Walter Elias Disney. In 1982, the Disneyland Railroad all-male crew continued under Disneyland ownership until the mid-1990s when women finally joined the ranks of the men. The railroad is not the only form of transportation available from Town Square near the entrance to the park. Providing transportation to the hub, the horseless carriage, the fire engine, the omnibus, and the horse-drawn streetcar all used to be driven exclusively by men. The general thought was that since the theme of Main Street was Middle America at the turn of the century, men were far more likely to ever drive these vehicles, and so men were cast accordingly. Women finally started working the Main Street vehicles in the mid-1990s. However, not all Main Street attractions were operated by all men crews. Consider the Disneyland Opera House. Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln debuted at the 1964 World's Fair, then got moved to the Disneyland Opera House in 1965, where it was later replaced by the Walt Disney Story in 1973. The removal of the Abraham Lincoln audio-animatronic figure sparked public criticism. And so, in 1975, the two shows were combined into the Walt Disney Story featuring Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. The Disneyland Opera House used to have an all-female crew, which helped balance out Main Street attractions since the Main Street vehicles were only operated by men at the time. This gave women an opportunity to be scheduled more hours than they would have otherwise. In 1995, the attraction became co-ed, and Kent Helwig and Mike Whalen became the first men to be trained on the attraction. Just for fun, every summer early mornings before the park opens, teams of cast members from around the park compete in canoe races around the rivers of America. One year, since the canoe team from Great Moments from Mr. Lincoln was all females at the time, Except for a guy or two to steer, the mostly all-female canoe team was called Abe's Babes. While there were a few attractions that had all-female crews, there were definitely more attractions with all-male crews. However, the balance was different in other departments. For example, in guest relations, most tour guides in the 1960s and 1970s were female. Male tour guides were few and far between until the 1980s, when male tour guides were finally on the rise. The Disneyland Ambassador Program began in 1965 with a new ambassador to represent Disneyland each year. While there were times that men tried out for the role of the Disneyland ambassador and may have even been selected as a finalist, between 1965 to 1994 not a single male was ever actually selected for this honor. In 1995 the ambassador program was modified. Instead of selecting a single Disneyland ambassador, 
for each year, a tradition begun by Walt Disney, Disneyland began to select a team of ambassadors for the year. In 1995, Jerry Aquino was selected to be the first male Disneyland ambassador. He was part of an ambassador team along with two women. From 1995 on, while women still outnumber men as Disneyland ambassadors over the years, it is no longer uncommon for a man to be part of the team. A place in the park where it was definitely common to see a man working was the submarine voyage in Tomorrowland. The submarine voyage opened in 1959 in Tomorrowland to an all-male crew, with the only exception being the live mermaids that entertained guests from the lagoon for four summers in 1959 and 1965 through 1967. Submarine voyage was the first attraction I was trained on when I transferred out of outdoor vending, selling popcorn and balloons, into Tomorrowland attractions. It was just after they painted the submarines yellow in 1987 from their original gray color because only men were trained on the submarines and it required such a large crew to operate. I was scheduled on the submarines a lot. Although this was a solid attraction for guests, it was repetitive and boring as a cast member to work. The attraction closed down in 1998 with women working the attraction only in its last years of operation. The submarine voyage reopened with a new theme set to Finding Nemo in 2007. The new version, Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage, opened with a co-ed crew of both male and female cast members and has been co-ed ever since. Before Astro Orbiter swirled rockets around at Tomorrowland's entrance, an earlier version of the attraction called Rocket Jets towered over Tomorrowland from the center of the land on the third floor of a structure that loaded guests onto the people mover on the middle floor and sold space mist at the lunching pad on the ground floor. Rocket jets had an all-female crew until about the mid-70s. Next to the rocket jets, in the location where Alien Pizza Planet is now, was an attraction that simulated space travel from Earth to the planet Mars called Mission to Mars. Originally, Mission to Mars was called Rocket to the Moon, and then later, Flight to the Moon, since real humans actually landed on the real moon in 1969, the attraction changed its destination from the moon to Mars. After all, it was located in Tomorrowland, and man landing on the moon was finally a reality and no longer a futuristic idea. Mission to Mars had an all-female crew until about the mid-70s. The attraction closed down in 1992. Right next to Mission to Mars was the Carousel Theater, Carousel of Progress, which debuted at the 1964 World's Fair as Progress Land, showed at Disneyland in California from 1967 to 1973. While the attraction was shown in the California part, it had an all-female crew. But get this. Sometimes the lead in charge of the attraction was a man, even though the rest of the crew were women. Carousel of Progress was moved to the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World to reopen in its Florida location in 1975. A new show replaced Carousel of Progress called America Sings in 1974. This attraction was intended to celebrate the bicentennial of the USA. On this new attraction, men joined the ranks of the women working the Carousel Theater. The final spin of the Carousel to see America Sings happened on April 10, 1988, long after our nation's bicentennial celebrations. And I was fortunate enough to be part of the audience, as I was a Tomorrowland Attractions cast member at the time. Not only did Tomorrowland have a Carousel Theater where the audience moved from scene to scene in a circle. It also had a film that projected onto screens all around you in a circle. America the Beautiful was a circle vision film that was presented on nine screens, 360 degrees all around you. The film was first shown in Disneyland in 1960 and was sponsored by American Motors. At the time, the attraction was simply called Cirque Car Rama. By 1967, the old 16mm projection system was perfected to a 35mm format and the sponsor became AT&T. The cast members that worked the attraction were from AT&T's host company, Pacific Telephone, and not Disneyland cast members. In those early years of operation, hosts were only women. They were AT&T employees on special assignment for six months, like an internship. Men were not integrated into the Circle Vision crew by AT&T until the late 1970s, early 1980s. By 1981, at the latest, the crew was co-ed. 
Around 1982, Disneyland started to also use their own cast members, in addition to the AT&T employees, to operate the attraction. As a corporate lessee, AT&T paid for all attraction expenses, including labor hours. In 1984, the film was replaced with a new Circle Vision film called American Journeys. By that time, the AT&T communications monopoly was broken up by the U.S. government and PSA Airlines became the attraction sponsor. The Circle Vision attraction closed in 1997 to make room for the queue for Rocket Rods, the attraction that replaced the People Mover as part of the 1998 New Tomorrowland. Getting hungry talking about all these Tomorrowland attractions? Let's talk about food in Tomorrowland. The Tomorrowland Terrace, a counter service food location in Tomorrowland that boasts a stage that rises from underground, opened in 1967. The Tomorrowland Terrace crew was segregated by sex. The men were relegated to working in the kitchen, and the women worked at the counter taking orders and collecting money. A female co worker of mine who used to work at the Tomorrowland Terrace told me that she was told that working in the kitchen involved lifting heavy objects such as the french fry baskets, and that would be easier for the guys. This all changed either in the late 70s or early 80s. From then on, both sexes were allowed to work the counter. It is quite clear from Disneyland history, not only that the opportunities offered to men and women have evolved and expanded over the years, but also the opportunities offered to gay and lesbian guests have improved. In 1980, two male gay friends, Andrew Exler, and Sean Elliott went to Disneyland and danced together at Tomorrowland Terrace. Disneyland had a strict rule that only opposite sex couples could dance together on the dance floor. The two platonic friends were prohibited by Disneyland security from continuing to dance together despite never touching each other or embracing each other while dancing. They sued in the case Exler vs. Disneyland. The trial judge ruled in favor of Exler, which meant Andrew Exler and Sean Elliott were now allowed to dance together at the park. However, this ruling only applied to Andrew and Sean and nobody else. They may have won the lawsuit, but the Disneyland same-sex dance policy had not changed except for just these two friends. By 1985, when Disneyland opened up their Videopolis dance floor in Fantasyland, the same-sex dance policy had been relaxed. I remember hearing at the time that teenage girls were wanting to dance together, and parents were complaining that they did not want their teenage girls to have to be obligated to find a male partner in order to be able to dance at Disneyland. By 1989, Disneyland no longer had the opposite sex couples only dance policy and stopped discriminating against same sex couples on the dance floor. Just like a Disney movie, these stories of homophobic policies and racial and gender based casting have a happy ending. Disney has always had a philosophy of four keys that guide everything they do, safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. In 2020, these four keys were expanded to five keys with the addition of inclusion. Now inclusion is a Disney key and is part of the foundation that Disney theme park culture is built upon. As American culture has evolved, so have Disney theme parks. Now I want to hear from you. Are there any locations in the park that you think would be better with an all-male or all-female crew? Let me know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like and subscribe right now to not miss any future episodes of the Palm Springs Linguist. It's completely free. All it does is tell YouTube to let my video surface for you to see. I'm Andy the Palm Springs Linguist. I hope that you enjoyed our trip to Disneyland and that you gained some insight into the history of the sexes here at the park. Until next time, I'm off to play tennis.